Good morning. Today I've come to the site of a battle that's befuddled generals and historians for almost a thousand years. It's a site of confrontation between Saxons on the one side and the Norman French on the other, coming across to change the country. The reason why we have words such as pigeon, beef and lamb in the English language. And today I'm going to take you on a tour around that battlefield, which today is not populated by Normans or Saxons, but unfortunately just by sheep and tourists. Right, so the year is 1066, and as we already should know, King Edward the Confessor is on the throes of his deathbed. He's a sickly king. He's a sickly king who hasn't been a very successful one. He hasn't been able to enact much power over the Godwin family. And as such, on 1066, on his deathbed, arguably, Harold Godwinson claims that Edward the Confessor has passed the throne to him. So this leaves Harold and William in a very difficult position. William, of course, being William, Duke of Normandy, William, the other side of the Channel, who thinks he's already got a claim to the throne. He's given to us in uh, a piece of evidence called the Bayou Tapestry. Going back to Harold Godwinson, though, Harold Godwinson, when he becomes king, on the death of Edward, early on in 1066, decides that he needs to gather an army to face two threats which face his kingdom. <laughs> The first threat that Harold Godwinson faced when he became king was to challenge the authority of his brother, his brother Tostig, who'd previously been an earl, a disgraced earl, who'd been exiled from the kingdom. Tostig decided to join forces with a famous Scandinavian warrior, a good old Viking, a bearded Viking, called Harold Hardrada, and together they decided to come and ravage the east coast of England, launching an invasion into York. In response to this, Harold Godwinson decided to gather one of the largest armies that England had ever seen. In actual fact, one of the chroniclers tell us it, it was the largest army that had ever been gathered in England. And with his forces, he marched his army up to Yorkshire to help defend, uh, help his friend, two friends out, the elves Edwin and Morcar, who'd previously been defeated at the Battle of Fulford Gate. So arriving close to York, a place called Stanford Bridge, in early September, Harold Godwinson managed to inflict a huge defeat on the Vikings, killing Harold Hardrada, his brother Tostig, and claiming one of the biggest victories that Anglo-Saxons had seen in their history. <laughs> However, while Harold Godwinson celebrated his huge victory over the Vikings, over Harold Hardrada and his brother Tostig, up in the north, the wind had changed down in the English Channel and allowed William, Duke of Normandy, and the huge forces which he'd gathered on the other side of the continent to sail with a huge invasion force over to the south coast. And now Harold Godwinson was faced with a dilemma. He had a huge army but had been kept out for a long, long time. In fact, he'd had to send most of them home. And he was left with what a chronicler called Orderic Vitalis called the scrapings of the Shire, the people he had to recruit as he travelled around. So he hurried down from Yorkshire and in ten days managed to reach all the way from Yorkshire down to where we are now, battle near Hastings. The reason why William of Normandy had gathered a large invasion fleet to travel over from his duchy in Normandy to the south coast of England was because he thought Harold Godwinson had done him over. Way back in 1064, Harold Godwinson had allegedly, according to Norman sources, travelled over to Normandy and sworn on two oaths that he was going to give the kingship of England to William, Duke of Normandy. Harold Godwinson, having taken the throne in 1066, had apparently forgotten to do this, so William of Normandy had divine rights to go over and take the throne for himself. <laughs> The Norman invasion force itself consisted of thousands of foot soldiers, supplies of wine and food that they brought over from France in order to uh, feed their soldiers. Not to mention the huge number of horses that the Normans brought with them as well. They had a special type of boat designed to carry horses across the dangerous journey on the Channel. And during that journey, William the Conqueror even thought that he'd lost all of his army. He was his boat sailing ahead of um, the main invasion force got lost in fog and he woke up that morning having breakfast, apparently the only ship 
in the English Channel. Fortunately, he waited, the fleet caught up with him, and he was able to make his landing at a place called Pevensey, an old Roman fort by the sea, which um, he took over, built fortifications in, and began to ravage the lands around the local area, which, of course, were owned by none other than Harold Godwinson himself. When Harold Godwinson, having been victorious at the Battle of Stanford Bridge, heard that William the Conqueror had landed in his lands on the south coast and was laying waste to those lands, he of course felt the need to act. So he gathered his army together and immediately marched down for 10 days from Yorkshire down to the Sussex coast. It was a march that was very quick at that time. And Orderic Vitalis, one of the Anglo-Norman chroniclers, tells us that on the way he was only able to gather what he called the scrapings of the Shire together. In effect, his army arrived at the top of this hill at battle, very tired, very hungry, and not very ready for battle. When the Anglo-Saxons arrived at the top of Senlac Hill, they formed a row, a shield wall, um, at the front line of their army, just as the Vikings had used against them. It was a popular tactic in this time because it was very, very difficult to break. Once you have formed your men up and they were joined, almost side on side with their shields, it was very tough to knock through into the main force of that body of men. And so William the Conqueror's knights on horseback charged up the hill, wearing themselves out. The Anglo-Saxons were pelted by arrows from the Norman ranks. Again, it still didn't break that shield wall. As the fighting grew more and more ferocious on both sides, Anglo-Saxon versus Norman on horseback, the shield wall stayed. And it was only until the Breton contingent on the Norman side of the army, on the left flank, decided to retreat that there seemed to be a gap appearing. In fact, the Norman army was so much weakened by the shield wall that many Normans thought that William the Conqueror had actually died, William the Bastard at this time, of course. And it was only when he rode around on horseback, showing off his face, pulling off his helmet, and showing that he was still alive, rallying his forces to the rest of his army, that morale was re regained, and they were able to cut the Anglo-Saxons off and break down that retreat that uh, initiated amongst the Breton contingent. So the battle continued on for hours and hours, from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Normans were pelting the Anglo-Saxons with arrows, and William of Normandy decided a great idea. He decided that, again, he was going to initiate this time a false retreat hoping that the Anglo-Saxons would again follow his horsemen down the hill. They did so, the Normans wheeled their horses around and cut the English down to a man. The shield wall was broken and a killing squad went in after Harold Godwinson. Some sources say that he was hit by an arrow in the eye first of all, but it seems on the Bayeux Tapestry that he was certainly hacked down and slaughtered on the battlefield. Oh, 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 oh. 